It is both a privilege and a pleasure to be among so many colleagues at a time of such considerable change in both our industry and in so many other areas of human endeavor. The last two or so years have been extraordinary for us all. Momentous for some, dreadful for others, crucial for all of us. And for a very few, exactly as predicted. A battle between rising populations and expectations leading to escalating demand and the need to find ways of satisfying that demand without mortgaging or even bankrupting future generations. We all know what the last two years have felt like to live through. And from where we sit today, things are far from over. Doom-mongers abound, and they should not be ignored. For theirs is a long and noble profession. The Reverend Thomas Malthus and the father of modern economics, Adam Smith, both warned during the 18th century of the catastrophic outcome of too many people chasing too few resources. And when you think about it, these last years have been all about just that. And it's been exactly the same for everyone. Our dilemma, sorry, trilemma, started with the uncomfortable but unavoidable truth that steel production accounts for some 8 to 10% of global carbon emissions, a percentage we have to reduce to achieve carbon neutrality, whilst at the same time coping with demand that's likely to more than double in the near future as the developing world industrializes. That is our particular blend of torment, torment we have to confront head on. If we don't, then public opinion and government legislation will force us to do so. And who wants to be forced to do something and to be seen as a reluctant convert if instead they can take control of their own destiny and be seen as a good guy. Now, more than ever, we need to be seen as responsible stewards of this planet. Our customers expect it, their customers expect it, and governments demand it. And the world over will thank us for it. The answers we provide today will define the future of our industry and a significant part of the future of our planet. Hence, I firmly believe they will also offer us some substantial opportunities. At Liberty, we are already developing these opportunities in order to transform our global manufacturing capabilities into a wholly decarbonized operation. Now that is a bold claim, but it's not an empty boast. Through our green steel strategies, we are working to construct a genuinely sustainable future. First, by treating steel and all our raw materials as precious commodities part of a circular economy to be used and reused time and again. Then, by manufacturing steel using hydrogen rather than coal, utilizing powerful technologies that release a tenth, just one tenth of the carbon discharged by conventional methods. And finally, by adopting lean processes that bring us closer to the changing needs of our customers. This is part of our way to resolve the trilemma affecting us all. And in so doing, we continue to save and create tens of thousands of skilled jobs and develop a resilient market for the foreseeable future. Rather than being seen as a fire-breathing carbon monster, steel can and will become a vital instrument of change, something that the future generations will point to when they look back and ask the question, what did you do to improve our way of life? Those future generations should see us all as a welcome addition to a brighter, better, and more sustainable economy going forward. Not an aging industry dragging everything back into a dingy and grimy past. So, if that's how we want to be seen, what can we do today to meet the future that's rushing headlong towards us? The answer comes in three parts. Adapt, adopt, and accelerate adapt our traditional habits and methods, adopt the best of new technologies, and accelerate the speed at which we design, develop, test, and implement the best of the new. If the last few years have taught us anything, 
they have shown us how to move and maneuver our giant industry swiftly and nimbly, to be agile, acrobatic, to pivot where necessary. This is what we have learned to do as a global organization. And this is what we must all do as an industry. There really is no alternative. Traditional approaches are incompatible with the urgency of climate change. And those operations that decarbonize first will gain market share. They will also present themselves as the most attractive investment options, options preferred by customers and consumers across the globe. And the technologies that will enable this transition are already available today. Primary amongst them, hydrogen. Hydrogen's crucial role in decarbonizing our industry cannot be overstated. And by using renewable energy to produce this hydrogen, then feeding it directly into our steel plants, we can even bypass storage and transportation issues, which pose the biggest challenge to the development of a hydrogen economy. So hydrogen is already at the center of liberty strategy. Here in Wyala in South Australia, where a new DRI plant and electric arc furnaces will produce green steel from abundant local magnetite resources, alongside a giant solar farm feeding hydrogen electrolyzers. And here in Ostrava in the Czech Republic, where we are building Europe's first hybrid furnaces that will eventually use 100% scrap. And again, here in Galatz in Romania, where we will transition our blast furnaces to DRI plants using natural gas first, achieving more than two thirds carbon reduction and eventually full carbon reduction when we move over to hydrogen. These initiatives will reduce emissions by up to 80% in the short term and in due course, full carbon neutrality once they shift fully to hydrogen rather than natural gas. I hardly need to point out that where we are today in the Middle East, the existing oil and gas infrastructure alongside abundant solar and wind power make the region a natural leader in the transition to hydrogen. Indeed, the Gulf is a key region for industrial decarbonization. The UAE launched its hydrogen leadership roadmap at COP26 last month, setting out a bold, ambitious vision by targeting a 25% global market share of low carbon hydrogen by 2030. My sincere respects to all of you for this outstanding leadership. Of equal importance is the reuse of steel scrap. In advanced economies such as the US, where iron ore is depleting, scrap is growing in availability. By combining scrap recycling in electric arc furnaces with renewable power, emissions can and will be dramatically reduced. Our Rotherham steel plant in the UK, which recently restarted, generates just 10% of the emissions of a traditional blast furnace. And on the lean manufacturing side, we have great technology right at our fingertips. For instance, Liberty Powder Metals is supporting fast-growing demand from the advanced manufacturing and 3D printing industries in the automotive, aerospace, and engineering sectors. A range of metal powders designed for precision components are produced in a way that cuts carbon emissions by 85% compared with the traditional steel route. Less waste, less energy, more value, and more protection for the planet, all for the future generations. The case is clear. Decarbonized steel can and will become an engine for growth and job creation. And it will do this in a sustainable way, inconceivable just a decade ago. But can we really do it? Or are we just saying that we're going to? We can, but only under certain conditions and with a clear and positive path forward. So for better or worse, here are, well, I won't call them predictions, but I do believe that much of what I'm about to say will most likely come to pass. I'll start with hydrogen. The world needs it, steel needs it, and the world needs steel. But to make the equation work, certain conditions must be just right. Prime amongst those conditions must be the ready sources of energy, abundant amounts of cheap renewable power, sun, water, wind. The kind of atmospheric conditions that abound in countries like Australia, Canada, parts of Europe like Sweden and Spain, 
the USA, and of course, right here in the Middle East. The closer the source of energy to the means of production and the raw materials necessary for manufacturing, the better. So as the means of production changes to provide for a greener future, so too will the whereabouts of where iron and primary steel is produced. Hence, our group's determined move to make Australia a global hub for green iron production using our abundance of high quality magnetite ore and renewable energy. So, number one, a fundamental shift in the geography of production is on the way. This plays into number two, an essential change in the infrastructure, the way we move things around the world. Rather than, to borrow a phrase, taking coal to Newcastle, we'll take the finished product, or actually more likely, the semi-finished product there instead. In fact, very little coal will be moving anywhere at all. Rather, we'll shift iron production to where the cheapest, most plentiful, most renewable power is to be found. After all, in a single hour, the amount of power from the sun that strikes the earth is more than the entire world consumes in a whole year. It seems perverse not to use it. Next, the population boom. Less of a boom, more of an explosion, brought about by both nuclear and extended families worldwide. Nowhere will this be more noticeable than in India, where the population is due to rise soon to two billion within one generation. That's two billion young, aspirational consumers, all clamoring for new homes, white goods to put in them, and something shiny on the road outside. In a word, all clamoring for steel. Now, number three, global demand for our products will double within just over a generation. And any holdups will have a catastrophic effect on the supply chain. A flimsy chain that is stretching and bending, and in many places, breaking already. Goods must be delivered right on time. And just in time was yesterday's phrase. Today, we have to be ahead of time. So, the need for energy moves the geography of production. This in turn changes the infrastructure which rebalances the global economy. And the same economy that must keep pace with explosive demand brought about by massively expanding populations. I mean, it's both the making of a nightmare, but also the basis of a soothing dream. A dream for those organizations that have readied themselves for tomorrow. A nightmare for those who have not prepared. At Liberty, we are playing our part, both through the rollout of the Green Steel Academies and the launch of the GFG Foundation. Not surprisingly, we sometimes lovingly call the foundation the Future Generations Foundation. The foundation works to inspire future generations of the critical importance of industry and the compelling case for transformation. A case that shows how low carbon steel production can produce sustainable profits and secure long-term employment, which in turn supports local economies and enables societies to thrive. A virtuous, not a vicious cycle. It will also help enable the new infrastructure needed to make our societies greener, from wind farms and renewable energy plants to public transport and electric vehicles. They all need green steel. And to achieve this, change is needed at a legislative level. Governments simply cannot wait. And the change must be global. No one country, no one company can hold up the sky alone. Steel is a global market. Emissions are a global issue and global policies are needed. Climate change does not recognize borders, and nor can we. Finally, we will all need financing to fund the transition to decarbonize steel. And it has to happen now. This is a critical decade, and immediate action is vital. Responsible steel production must evolve at a pace to meet the urgent social, economic, and environmental challenges that face us all. We must harness the momentum created by booming demand, and we must learn the hard lessons of recent years. So, as I hope you can hear, despite the challenges, I am genuinely optimistic about Green Steel. The potential is 
overwhelming. 1.3 gigatons of reduced CO2 emissions by 2030. And that's just nine years away. So let me end where I started with those two mangas I mentioned earlier. In 1972, a highly influential book, The Limits of Growth, put the spotlight on a simple, simple question. Using the results of a computer-generated model for the entire world economy, taking in commodity prices, food production, pollution and population growth, the book asked a simple question. How could things develop if resource extraction would require more and more energy and therefore more and more money? What a timely question. Timely then and now. And their answer back in 1972 was, continued growth would inevitably cause us to run up against a number of natural boundaries. Boundaries on how much we can extract from different resources and how much waste our planet is capable of handling. In short, the authors claimed that society would be forced to devote an ever-increasing share of its resources to sustaining growth. And they predicted that by some time during the 21st century, i.e. now, society would no longer be able to maintain the necessary levels of production. Now, parts of that argument are still highly relevant, but the authors clearly neglected perhaps the ultimate renewable, indeed, the infinitely expandable resource of all, our human intelligence. And it's that self, same intelligence that will turn steelmaking into one of the cleanest low carbon industries on the planet. Indeed, it is already doing so. Hence, my final prediction. We can and will become a bright beacon for tomorrow. And most importantly of all, we will do it for future generations. I thank you.